All right, we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, I have a few questions to ask you as we begin today. Uh, I want to ask you some questions like, does it bother you that you don't have what it takes to minister in Christ's kingdom? No. <laughs> Not at all. Well, this will be a good story for you, my friend. Yeah. So does it bother you that you don't have what it takes to minister? And the second question is, does it comfort you that the Lord is able to provide for us when we offer ourselves to Him to be used for His kingdom? Yeah. Does it comfort you? Yeah, this story is a lot about provision. It's a lot about I can't and he can. It's a lot about I am inadequate, he is totally adequate. It is about I am do not have the capacity and a lot about he has great capacity. I heard Dino up there talk about, what was it? Almighty? What did he say? Instead of almighty, it was... All might. I think it was all might. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, um, when you look at vast needs, insurmountable, huge needs around you, do you freeze? Do you tend to say, I can't? Do you tend, tend to say, I don't have what it takes? I would never be able to do that. I could never... God could never use me to do that. It's just too immense, too big for me. I would suggest that many of us struggle with that. When I was in seminary, there were a lot of firstborns, high achievers, uh, people that were there to study God's Word. They'd already been to college, four years of college uh, torture, and then they went on to seminary. And that's the same as doctors and lawyers and stuff. But when you go on, they went there and they got degrees and they became, they got master's degrees and they got doctorates. And one of the professors at seminary that I loved, who was very down to earth, had at least three PhDs to his name on the wall. <laughs> and he was such a humble man. But one of the things I learned about being at seminary with those kind of people who are high achievers, firstborns, was that um, one of the most significant problems they had was lack of self-confidence. In other words, I know a lot, but I, I can't fight my way out of a paper bag. I am afraid. I am not sure God could use me. And a great sense of inadequacy and uh, incapacity. And then the other question I have before we start is, do you ever look around you and see needs? I mean, is life uh, more about you and your world and your struggles and your thoughts, your family, about you, or do you actually see, is this not working? Pardon? Okay, all right. Uh, or, or do you really see the needs around you? Because I think that once we see, what happens next is really, really important. Because we might see a need and go, well, that's for the, the big guns, or that's for the pastor, or that's for someone else to solve, or people with lots of money, or people with lots of resources, but that's not me. So what happens when we see a need next is really, really important. So if you'll turn with me to uh, John chapter 6, we're going to see a classic, classic, amazing story about God providing for the needs of many, many people. I call this fast food. <laughs> uh, this is a sign. This is a semion. This is something that happened that demonstrated something else. And it demonstrates something amazing about the Lord Jesus. 
It's wonderful. So it's a sign. In fact, it must be important because Matthew and Mark and Luke and John all record this miracle. It was a miracle. It wasn't sleight of hand. It wasn't just symbolic. All four of the gospel writers said this was a miraculous sign in the hands of the Lord Jesus. And so John was probably familiar with the other evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and what they had written. His is a unique accounting of this story. And probably John was an eyewitness there. Probably John uh, made his way over to the eastern, northeastern corner of the Sea of Galilee and witnessed this amazing sign. And we find in this sign that Jesus um, uh, demonstrates his authority over quantity. <laughs> he didn't just provide a little fish or a little loaf of bread, but he fed, it says in all four accounts, 5,000 men. And then uh, they would, they probably had wife, a wife or two, <laughs> and children. And so some people estimate that there could have been as many as 10,000. The biggest crowd I think I've ever been in where food was served was at the former kingdom during Promise Keepers and all these, well, first of all, I just remember walking up the ramp on the outside of the kingdom to get to the top floor. And because we had had to park so far away, um, we had to walk a long ways and we got there just as the worship was beginning in the kingdom. Now I think football games are pretty exciting. I mean, I, I went to one football game, a preseason game of Seattle against Buffalo sitting in the 200 level where a couple of drunk men started fighting and almost shoved each other off the balcony. <laughs> that was a pretty amazing event. You know, and I've heard the crowds screaming and yelling, but I said, when I walked, when I walked up and almost got in, because we had to sit way in the top of the kingdom for this session, and the worship band was beginning to play, and 65,000 men started singing and filling the kingdom with worship of Christ. And I couldn't even walk in. I mean, I, I just remember being overcome with the emotion of that sense of these men singing at the top of their lungs to the glory of Jesus. And uh, that was pretty cool. And then after the speakers and uh, after the worship and stuff, then it, we had to deal with the practical issue of food. <laughs> so I remember walking back down and they just had lines and rows of box lunches for all these guys trying to feed them. <laughs> and it was really good. And we all sat down on the pavement out there and had lunch. It was just an amazing time. But that was the biggest uh, group that I ever saw that had to be fed. And uh, uh, that was my memory. One other time I went to a wedding over in Eastern Washington. My cousin's son got married. He was a farmer over there. And his uh, wife's family was a farming family and I think they did really really well but anyway if you can imagine I, I if any of you have this kind of wedding coming up be sure and put me on the list but there was uh, 400 people invited to this wedding over by Ellensburg somewhere I think it was at Suncadia 400 guests and so it came time to eat and all those 400 guests had to be feed it, fed. And you know how much it was a plate? This, is, this tells you they must have been well-to-do farmers. <laughs> it was 100 bucks a plate just for the dinner at the wedding. I mean, that was, if you did the math, that's $40,000 just for dinner for those people. And I'm telling you, it was really, really good food. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, anytime you hear about that, let me know, and we'll show up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is, a, this is actually a, an amazing story accounted by uh, each of the four uh, gospel writers. 
And they laid down their lives for Christ, for the truthfulness of what they wrote, what they left for us in the gospel accounts. So I believe it's truthful. So first of all, you have Jesus has been in Jerusalem. We know that he has had conversations with Nicodemus. Um, and what he was teaching Nicodemus there, who was a very learned man, a learned rabbi was, that it's not learning, but life that I came to impart. And the life that Jesus taught him begins with birth. Um, and it's called the second birth or the birth from above. And Jesus taught Nicodemus about life. Uh, that he is the source of life. But now, in John's account, we have moved to Galilee, and here we find out that he is the one who supports life. He provides food. He meets needs. He, is, uh, he supports life. And then we're going to find out in the next section that he guides and strengthens us when we're toiling, when we're struggling. So today we're going to be looking at this event in Galilee, uh, and we see how he supported life by providing food. And we know that there is, uh, in chapter 5, verse 1, uh, Jesus, there was the feast of the Jews, and uh, Jesus was at the pool of Bethesda in uh, Jerusalem. But now, in chapter 6, maybe six months later, after this, he moves to the other side, and uh, he goes to a more sparsely populated place. Uh, there are fewer Jews there because the Jews were increasing in their hostility toward Jesus. And in this case, he was uh, moving to Beth, uh, Bethsaida. And archaeologists have tried to decide exactly where that is. But I just watched a video this week about Bethsaida. And there is an archaeological dig right there. And there's a Roman bath that they have discovered with Roman coins which date. When you find a coin in the ground, it dates the, the location. It's like a stamp. And so uh, they have found this Roman bath. They have found coins. And they know exactly when it was. It was a fishing village. It was probably the home of Andrew and Simon Peter, and Philip. And we know that Andrew and Peter moved to the other side of the lake later to Capernaum. Uh, but this was, um, at least at some point, it was the home of Andrew and Peter and Philip. And his name, in case you were wanting some trivia, is the lover of horses. So if you know anybody named Philip, they got to love horses, I guess. So, Okay, so after this, Jesus went away. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Okay, so he went away to the other side. And um, we know from Matthew chapter 14, now when Jesus heard about the death of John the Baptist, you know, he was... Uh, made a little bit shorter. They cut his head off, remember? Uh, through, uh, and uh, so, and, and there was also a growing hostility toward him, and so he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself, a lonely place uh, uh, to be by himself, to be by themselves. So if you look at the book of Luke, we know that just before this event, Jesus had sent his disciples out uh, on a mission. They had some activity to do. They had some things to learn. They had some things to experience. They had to, and so Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, talk about them being sent out in ministry. It's a good time to learn, right? Isn't it a good time to learn after you've tried some things? Is it? I think it's a better time than before you experience them. You know, Harold Weiss used to talk about how, you know, it's just a long story, but he was grinding a carriage bolt head off of a bolt of a trailer up in Alaska, and a really hot bolt finally flew off onto the floor, and his 
grandson grabbed that thing with his bare hand, with his red hot, and then he dropped it really quick. And then all Harold said was, well, did you learn anything? <laughs> yeah, and we use that wisdom all the time, don't you? So I think that Jesus sent his disciples out. Look at chapter 9 of Luke for a minute. And uh, this was their, their being sent out as the 12 apostles, the 12 ones that were sent. It says, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He sent them out in ministry to try something on. Okay? And he said to them, take nothing with you for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, nor money. And do not have two tunics. I'm just going to say it sounds like our daughter in Nepal. It sounds like the way that OM trains missionaries in Nepal. Don't take money. Don't take, and I'm serious, they would take one change of clothes and they would totally pray and depend upon the Lord as they went out in ministry all the way across Nepal, all the way from the Kathmandu area almost to Pakistan, sharing the gospel, leaving the Bible and uh, tracts with the people that they encountered. And the way they did it was, you're not... Don't come with a big pocket full of money. Come with faith in the Lord. And so that's how Jesus was teaching his disciples. But now, after they come back, Jesus is going to teach, and it's a great time to teach after the activity, after the ministry, after the success or failure, after the struggle. And it says that he went away to a lonely place, a solitary place, so that he could have privacy and he could give his disciples some instruction. And uh, so that's what happened. And so in this story, Jesus is going to, I'm giving you a preview, but he is going to, uh, we're going to see Jesus' capacity to meet needs. Secondly, the disciples' incapacity to meet needs. And then, number three, Jesus' instruction really about trusting Jesus. I don't know if you know this, I might have said it before, that in the book of John, the verb to believe or to trust can be found 98 times. Belief is meant to be something that is ongoing, to believe and to continue to believe in Christ. And so uh, <clears throat> the disciples we're going to be instructed about trusting Christ. And just so you know, the word faith or belief as a noun, guess how many times you find it in the book of John? Zero. It's interesting. Just interesting. John did not think of faith as something like an object. He, he thought of faith believing or trusting in the Lord as an ongoing activity that the disciples were going to need to learn. So, chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. They had already seen his ministry. They had already seen what he was able to do in healing the sick. And so how serious were they in following Jesus? Pretty serious. Serious enough to walk four miles. So we're going to just try that today. We're going to take a little walk out through the freeway and back right now. How's that sound? <laughs> but that's how far they were willing to walk to be with Jesus because they had seen him performing wonderful miracles. And so, um, especially the healing of the nobleman's son in Capernaum, which is just on the other side of the lake from where they were going now. And so there's, uh, in fact, if you look at John chapter 6 and you just drop down a little bit further to verse 31, um, 
we're going to see a kind of a parallel between what Jesus is doing here and what Moses did for the people back in the book of Exodus. Chapter 6 and verse 31 says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. God gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you, my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So this is all about God's provision of the true bread of, G of God, just like Moses, God providing, God's provision of the true bread. So, we learn from this passage also in verse 4 that the Passover was at hand. And just, this may seem a little bit like trivia, but I would say that in the, in the life of Jesus, he went through probably three Passovers. The first one you can find in John chapter 2. The second one you can find here in John chapter 6. And the third one you can find in John chapter 13, where the uh, upper room discourse takes place on the Passover. So that's how we know that Jesus' ministry probably lasted how long? Three years, yeah. That's how we could kind of guess that. So that's the setting. Um, people were thinking, because it was Passover, they were probably thinking about the sacrificial blood of sacrifices. They were thinking of flesh and lambs and unleavened bread. And uh, they may have been longing for a new Moses to, to deliver them as Moses delivered the people from Pharaoh. May, they might have been thinking about a new Moses rising up to deliver them from the Romans. <clears throat> so that's the setting. And now here's the problem. There's a problem here. And that's what we'll come to next. Uh, John chapter 6 and verses 5 and 6. Um, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread? That's a great question. You know, he didn't just start out saying, here's how we're going to deal with this. He saw the crowd. He saw 5,000, maybe 10,000 people coming. He had been up with his disciples. And the first thing he does is ask, Philip, where in the world are we going to get bread to feed all these people? Isn't that a great question? Does that make you wonder? I wonder what Philip was thinking after that question. I wonder what he believed. Where are we going to get money? Or what did he say? Where? I'm sorry. Where are we going to buy it? Yeah. So where are we to buy bread? So there's a question about location and there's a question about money. There's finances involved here. Where is it going to happen? Where are we going to get the bread? Enough for all these people. And then how are we going to pay for it, right? So that these people may eat. God was interested in those people. God was interested in those 5,000 men and their wives and their children. He was interested in them. Jesus was interested in them. He lifted up his eyes and it mattered. It mattered whether their needs were met or not. And so he asked Philip that penetrating question. And Philip answered, well, 200 denarii, and I'm going to ask you what that is, so just tell me in a minute here. 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. How much is 200 denarii? What does your study Bible say? Pardon? Well, one denarii is a one full day's wage. So, eight months. Yeah, it could be seven or eight months. 
Now, how much money do you make in seven or eight months? Or did you make before you retired? <laughs> how much is that? And they said, if you add all that up, that's not going to be enough to even give every one of those 10,000 people a little bit. So it's a problem, isn't it? It's a problem of resources. And it's a problem of faith, of believing, trusting in Jesus. And so Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw the large crowd that was coming toward him and thinking about how to feed them. And this was a teaching moment. And it says specifically in this text, look what it says. Um, Verse 6 says, He said this to what? To test him. He said this to Philip to test him. Now, God doesn't test us, right? To tempt us to sin. He was wanting to reveal what was in, what was in the heart of this um, this disciple. Um, and I think that God tests us in order to refine, refine our faith. God tests us in order to refine our faith. Look at, for example, and, and we're not going to read the whole story, but remember the story of Abraham. And he was told by God to take his son, his only son, and to take him up on Mount Moriah and to offer him there as a sacrifice. Remember that story? And so he did, and they're going up the hill, and I think the son is kind of thinking, well, I can see the, 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 the fire, or the wood and the fire, and, you know, and we're going up the hill, but I'm not seeing the sacrifice anywhere here. <laughs> You know, he's kind of, it's starting to dawn on him, we don't have a lamb, we don't have a sacrifice to offer on the, on the fire. But look at, turn with me back to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. This is so good. This is so clear. What God was doing with Abraham there. Genesis chapter 22 and verse... Um, Wealth. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For what? Now I know something. Now something about you, Abraham, has been revealed in this test. For now I know that you fear God. You have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket. Now the point that I'm making is just that God saw something through the test about Abraham. And so God does that. God tests his people to see what's in them. So when God asked, when Jesus asked Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? It says clearly he said that to test him, to find out what was inside of Philip. Where was his faith? Where was he tested, trusting the Lord? So that's the problem. And then we find in verse 7, the disciples' inability. This is where we have to come to understand that we have an inability to do what God asks us to do. If we think that we have the resources, if we think we have the skill, if we think we have it all together, if we think that all i got to do is scheme and plot and, and maneuver and, and move forward, sounds like Jacob, doesn't it? If we think that that's all, that we have all that it takes up here, then we're missing the point of this story because this story clearly says 
that the disciples struggled with their inability, with their lack of ability to meet the needs, such a huge need. They didn't have one denarii, maybe they did. They didn't have 200 denarii. Um, so they had a complete disability. Let me just see if I can find in Luke. You don't have to turn there. But in Luke chapter 9 and verse 13... <laughs> their solution was send the crowd away. Send them away. We don't have it. We can't do it. Send them somewhere else. Go to a different <coughs> church. You know, go to a different community. We can't help them. Sorry. They said send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and to get provisions. Just send them away. Let someone else deal with them. Let someone else take care of them. That's a weakness of trust in God, isn't it? I mean, when we hand it off to someone else because we don't have the resources or we don't have the money or we don't have the time, we're just being like them, aren't we? So uh, send them away to get the provisions that they need for we are here in a desolate place. We don't have the resources. That's exactly what is going on here. So they, finally, in Luke chapter 9, verse 13, Jesus said, Jesus said this. Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 9, he said, but you give them something to eat. But you do it. He was not letting them off the hook, was he? He said, you give them something to eat. And then they, then they finally went out and did a little checking around at the resources that they had, which is what we often do. How much money do we have in the bank? How much time do I have on my schedule? How much am I willing to invest in meeting this need? I don't know. But they said, well, all we've got is some hors d'oeuvres here. And that's really what it was. It's like hors d'oeuvres. It's like little crackers with a little sardine in it. Maybe you could roll the fish up inside of the little bread thing and have a couple morsels. But he says, that's all we could come up with. This little kid over here, he just he brought lunch with him. And, and here you go. I'm, I'm wondering after a while whether Andrew felt a little embarrassed about that. But he was just doing what Jesus said. And, well, we've got five loaves and two fish. <laughs> um, and, but, but what is this? What are these hors d'oeuvres? What is this? small resource compared to the great need. The great needs around us. The crowd of people that are hungry that have walked for four miles and there's no place for them to lodge or have food. So the options were that they were given were number one, they could share what they had which wasn't going to be enough. You know, we'll just Take what we have and share it, but that's not going to work. Number two, uh, they could tell the people to just journey on into town and uh, get and and pick up enough food for everyone, but they couldn't do that. And and the third thing which they didn't do was to ask Jesus to provide the food because the disciples didn't even do that, did they? So. I'm not going to go there today, but if you want to see an incredible parallel into the Old Testament, uh, it's in the life of Elisha, and it comes from 2 Kings 4, 42 through 44. Uh, a man brought some bread and grain to the man of God, to Elisha, in order to feed a hundred prophets. It's kind of like having a hundred preachers gather together, and they were trying to feed a hundred preachers, and... Uh, so this man brought some bread and grain to the man of God. And uh, you'll have to read that story. But it's very similar. It's like, how, do, how is that ever going to be enough to feed 100 preachers? I think preachers are pretty good at potlucks and stuff like that. Pretty sure. Okay, so um, now you come back to John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. And you have Andrew... And he said to him, there's a boy here. 
who has five barley loaves and two fish. Barley loaves. Barley was a poor man's bread and uh, maybe a couple of sardines. And um, it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that the resources that they had to offer were inadequate. They were not able. They didn't have enough to do it. But in chapter 10, 6, verse 10, Jesus, Jesus, now I'm just going to warn you ahead of time that we're going to get through this very familiar story and it's going to become very, very practical for us, okay, for you and me. But for now, Jesus says in chapter 6 and verse 10, um, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place. Isn't that a great picture? Have them sit down. And so they're sitting down in groups of 50. There's maybe 100 groups, maybe 200 groups of people sitting down on the grass. And Jesus, the good shepherd, is about ready to perform a miracle. A miracle, something that is, and it's something that supersedes or interrupts nature, and he is going to feed those people. It reminds us, doesn't it? Doesn't it remind us of the shepherd's psalm? Doesn't it remind us of the shepherd's psalm? You ever read? You ever think about Psalm 23? Maybe 500,000 times. <laughs> what a great psalm that David wrote. Right? It says, The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. I shall not want with the Lord my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down or sit down on the grass. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. I think that's going on here. Don't you? Have the people sit down. And I want to tell you something. Because Jesus was teaching his disciples. He was teaching his men about how he provides. And they don't. Their job is to trust him to be the resource, the conduit of God's blessing to people's needs. They had to learn about trusting him, but he is the provider. I don't know how to reach my neighbor. Well, Lord, I don't know how to reach my neighbor, but here's my barbecue. I'll give you my barbecue. I'll give you Thursday afternoons. I'll give you part of my paycheck. I will give you my resources. I'll give you my five loaves and two fish. I'll, I'll put it in your hands, but it's not enough. You're going to have to provide it through me. You're going to have to do that. So I want you to turn to Acts chapter 3. This is after the resurrection of Christ. This is the beginning of the church. This is the disciples. These are the followers of Christ who were beginning to learn that God was the provider, not them. And that God supplied for the needs of the people through them. Look at Acts chapter 3 and verse 6. But Peter said, but Peter said, fisherman Peter, the one who had probably tasted those hors d'oeuvres. But Peter said, I have no silver and I have no gold. But what I do have, I give to you in the name 
of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. Look what, look down at verse 16 of chapter 3. And, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. The disciples were learning that it's in the name of Jesus, it's in the authority of Jesus, it's in the power of Jesus that that man's need was met. And then look at chapter 4, verse 10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. They were learning. They were learning that they were inadequate, that God was adequate. They didn't have the capacity. God had all the capacity that was needed. And so um, I, I came across this quote from a man named Vanderloos. I don't even know him, but he was talking about liberal scholars who look at this passage of Scripture <laughs> And they have a lot of fun with it. Did you know that? People that don't believe in God, people that don't believe in the miraculous, the supernatural. Are you a supernaturalist? Are you? I am. I'm a supernaturalist. I believe in the miracle working, powerful working of God in our day, in our midst. <clears throat> and so he said, it is without doubt a fascinating business to investigate how human ingenuity reaches new heights in its efforts to eliminate the supernatural. <laughs> he said, it's fascinating to see how quickly people will try and eliminate the supernatural. But Augustine says, Augustine wrote that the food multiplied in the hands of Jesus. During that miracle, it says that uh, Augustine at least saw that the food multiplied in the hands of Jesus. And the word there is in the imperfect tense, and it means that he continued to give. He continued to give to his disciples. So I think the food multiplied in his hands, and he continued to give the food to his disciples who became the conduit or the vessels of distribution to the needs of the people. But in the hands of Jesus, I think the food was multiplied. John Calvin said that it grew in the disciples' hands. I don't know that that... I don't think so. So I don't agree with John Calvin. <laughs> Not that I'm anywhere near his. So this is Jesus' creative capacity. It's like turning the water to wine. It's Kind of like creating the universe. <laughs> I mean, he has pretty significant creative ability, doesn't he? If all things were made through him and by him and for him, certainly wouldn't have too much problem with multiplying food or turning water to wine. Now, let's just look at a couple passages here. This is for our comfort. I hope these are comforting to you. They have to do with meeting needs, and God filling, God taking care of his people. If you ever doubt that God is interested in you or willing to meet your needs, look at these Psalms, 37 and verse 19. I think they're in your notes if you have them there. Psalm 37 and verse 19. I'll start with verse 18. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. Isn't that great? 
In days of famine, they have abundance. Look at Psalm 81, 81, verse 16. Are you with me? Are you guys awake? Okay, just check it. Psalm 81, verse 16. Verse 15. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward Him, and their fate would last forever, but He would feed you with the finest of the wheat and with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. Isn't that great? Psalm 132, 15. Verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. And one more, Psalm 145. And verse 15. 14. The Lord upholds those who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. This is a story and I'll just read this, the people feast at the feet of one who is about to be confessed as Messiah as he trains his disciples to depend on his ability to meet needs. Isn't that great? Let me say it again. The people feast at the feet of one who is about to be confessed as Messiah as he trains his disciples to depend on his ability to meet needs. So here are four lessons. You can put them in your notes if you'd like to. First of all, we, his disciples, are unable or limited in capacity to meet needs, to meet large needs, to meet needs. If we see needs, a good place to start is, I'm not able to meet that need. I don't have the resources. I don't have the money. I don't have the faith. I don't have what it takes. I can't. It's too great of a need for me. So we as disciples are unable, or at least limited in capacity, to meet large needs. Number two, Jesus is unlimited in his capacity to meet human needs. Jesus is unlimited in his capacity to meet human needs. Number three, our job, your job, my job, our job, once we have seen a need, is to trust, that's a verb, to trust Jesus. Our job is to trust Jesus. And number four, I already said it, our job is to see needs. Our job is to see needs. And I'm not going to minimize physical needs. I don't know how you can read the book of James. I don't know how you can read about food and clothing and widows and orphans and the needs of those around us without understanding physical needs. We know that we're supposed to be involved with that. Um, one of my seminary professors whom I dearly love when he got through the book of James and he came to the chapter that talked about doing something, you know, uh, seeing someone in need of clothing or food and 
saying, well, go and be warmed and be filled and not doing anything. He was talking about you cannot escape the responsibility that we have toward those who cannot feed themselves, cannot pay their rent, cannot pay their utility bills, cannot, cannot, cannot. That's nothing to do with people who are able to work and won't work. That's kind of the way Lewis County thinks of things, you know. Well, if you just get a job and go out and work hard, you can do this. And we don't need to pay you because you can do it. And that's true. And I think that the work ethic in the New Testament is you go out and work hard with your hands so that you might have something to give to those who are in need. Ephesians chapter 4. So I cannot eliminate the meaning of physical needs. I remember this professor said, you know, and in my role as a seminary professor and in the circles that I travel, I hardly ever even come in contact with a poor person. I don't know that I've met hungry people, starving people, people who can't pay their bills, people who can't. I, I don't know. So anyway, but I think Jesus did. He saw and he addressed their needs. But there's a course and this is what we dare never drift away from is that human beings have a huge spiritual need. They have a need for the new birth. They have a need for the second birth. They need to be born from above by believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus. And so it's our job to preach and to teach and to tell people, especially in our day, when eyes and ears and hearts are closing to the Lord Jesus, we, we just need to say, well, Lord, I can't seem to get through to that person. Well, good, you don't have the capacity anyway. But you have the capacity, if God will, if you give what you have to the Lord, He will use you. He will use you to meet physical needs, but he will also use you to bring people into the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're learning in this lesson, aren't we? So we need to have eyes of faith that see big, impossible needs. And then we need to trust in an almighty God, <laughs> in an almighty God, all-powerful God, who is infinite, who is fully able to meet the needs that we see. So how are your eyes doing? Some of you need to get your cataracts taken care of at PCLI <laughs> so that you can see clearly around you. Or you need to go get some new uh, prescription glasses. I know Kathy lays at night sometimes now with her new glasses or new uh, lenses and looks up at the star. She hasn't done that since you were six years old, have you? <laughs> Haven't been able to. We have to see. Really, I think one of the best things we can do this week is just, God, help me to see clearly the people around me that have needs. I think it's like 10,000 people walking up across to be with you and they don't have food and there's lots of needs. There's no shortage of needs unless we close our eyes, unless we close our hearts, unless we say, I don't have the resources, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't care. That's the worst thing, right? I don't care. Jesus cared, didn't he? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you cared for us. We thank you, Lord, that when you hung on the cross, you had us in mind, and you had many, many more people in mind. You shed your blood. You loved the world so much that you gave your son. Lord, uh, thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, for the glory of, of your taking this teaching opportunity to train your disciples to trust you. To know that they didn't have what it took, but you had all that they needed. Lord, I pray that if you were here today and you told us you give them something to eat, you give them something to eat, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to obey you this week, whatever that means. In Christ's name, amen.